In this video we'll be going through the 2020 Mechanical Systems paper. Question 1. Tom flies a Boeing 737-800, which is an average sized plane with a takeoff mass of 7.5 times 10 to the 4 kilograms. There are times when he flies horizontally in a straight line, and there are times where he has to take a circular path such that the plane is banked at an angle to the horizontal. The diagrams below represent these two situations. Draw the force due to gravity and the lift force on the plane in the two situations below. And so first of all, the force of gravity is going to be the same in both situations, both in its magnitude and also its direction. The lift force, however, is going to be straight up in our first scenario and at an angle in our second. Compare the size of the force due to gravity and lift force on the plane when Tom flies it horizontally in a straight line and when he flies it in a horizontal circle banked at an angle. Give reasons why they are similar or different in each situation. And so the force due to gravity is not going to change in either scenario, but the lift force is, both in direction and also in its magnitude. In the first scenario, the lift force is going to be equal and opposite the force due to gravity. And in the second scenario, the horizontal component of the lift force is going to be unbalanced, creating a centripetal force, whereas the vertical component of the lift force is going to be the one countering and cancelling gravity. So let me put that into words. In the first example, the gravitational and lift force are equal and opposite. In the banked example, the gravitational and vertical lift are equal and opposite, but there is also a horizontal lift component providing a centripetal force. The lift force must therefore be larger. On one occasion, Tom flies the plane of mass 7.5 times 10 to the 4 kgs in a circular path with a speed of 54 meters per second, banked at an angle of 35 to the horizontal. Calculate the radius of the circle that the plane describes, and also explain your working. So let's start off by doing a diagram. So we have our banked plane going around in a circle with our gravitational and lift forces. We have a mass of 7.5 times 10 to the 4 kgs, a velocity of 54 meters per second, and an angle of 35 degrees. Now, if we were to take our forces and make a vector triangle, it would look something like this. Where our force of gravity and our lift force are equal to our centripetal force. This gives us a handy right angle triangle, where this angle here is our angle that is 35 degrees. So what we're trying to do is of course find our radius, and to do so we need to use the centripetal force equation. Solving that for R, where we have our mass and we have our velocity, but we don't have our centripetal force. So we need to find that. To find our centripetal force, we can make use of our right angle triangle, where we can easily find our force due to gravity by multiplying our mass here by the acceleration due to gravity. And our centripetal force here is of course what we're trying to find. Now in this case, our gravity is our adjacent side and our centripetal force is our opposite. So the relationship we're looking for is that tan of our angle equals our opposite, which is our centripetal force, divided by our adjacent, which is the force due to gravity. Solving that for Fc by multiplying both sides by Fg, and I'm also going to swap the sides around. Putting our numbers in, where our force due to gravity is our mass times the acceleration due to gravity, and that gives me 515178 newtons, giving enough significant figures to negate any rounding errors later on. So now we can just put our numbers into our equation over here. Which gives me 4 to 5 meters to 3 significant figures, which is the amount of significant figures we're given in the question. Tom then flies his plane at a height of 1.28 times 10 to the 4 meters above the surface of the Earth. 
calculate the gravitational field strength at the height Tom flies the plane. And we're given the mass of the Earth and also the radius of the Earth. And so we know that the force due to gravity is equal to our mass times acceleration. And to be clear, when we're talking about gravitational field strength, we are talking about the acceleration and not the force. Our other equation for gravity is this one here, where our mass of Tom's plane, which is our lowercase m, can cancel out to make things a little bit more straightforward, which leaves us with this equation here, where our capital M is the mass of the Earth. So now all we need to do is put our numbers in. And our radius in this case is going to be the radius of the Earth plus the height of our plane. Which gives me 9.80 meters per second per second to three significant figures. Question two. Sandra dives from a diving board that is 10 meters high. She finds she can do somersaults by tucking her body in. In the tucked position, her body can be modelled as a sphere of mass 60 kgs and radius 0.2 metres. The rotational inertia of a sphere is given by I equals 2 fifths mr squared. While in the tucked position, she dives with a constant angular velocity of 9.56 radians per second, show that her angular momentum is 9.18 kg meter square per second. So let's write down what we know. Her mass is 60 kgs, her radius is 0.2 meters, her angular velocity is 9.56 radians per second, and we also know the height of the diving board here, but I don't think that'll come into play. So to find our angular momentum, we need to use this equation here, where we know our angular velocity, but we don't yet know our inertia. We are, however, given the equation to find it, which is right up here. Putting our mass and radius in, gives me 0.96 kg meter square. Now putting our numbers into our angular momentum equation, indeed gives me 9.18 kg meter square per seconds. Just before entering the water, she straightens her body, thereby changing her rotational inertia. Explain what effect this will have on her rotational motion, comment on her angular velocity, rotational kinetic energy, and you may ignore the effects of friction while she is in the air. So let me just launch right into my explanation. When she straightens, she increases her radius, which via I equals 2 fifth mr squared, increases her rotational inertia. As there are no external torques, angular momentum must be conserved. As L equals I omega, this means an increase in I will proportionally decrease omega. E rot equals half I omega squared shows that if I increases and omega decreases in equal proportion, E rot will decrease as omega is squared. It takes Sandra 0.28 seconds to straighten her body just before entering the water. Her rotational inertia becomes 4.80 kg meter square. Calculate her angular deceleration during this time. Now, to write down everything we know is probably going to fill all of these lines, so let's instead figure out what we need. Now, if we use our equation for angular acceleration, we see that we do know the time, and we also know our initial angular velocity, we were given it above. What we don't know is our final angular velocity, so we need to find that. Now, we're given her rotational inertia here, specifically her final rotational inertia. And we also know the angular momentum. This is important because we know, looking at our formula sheet, that the angular momentum, which we know, is equal to inertia times angular velocity, which is either going to be final or initial, because we're trying to find the final is indeed the final. So knowing our angular momentum here, knowing our final rotational inertia, we can find our angular velocity just by solving this equation, which we can do quite simply just by dividing both sides by IF, and I'm also going to swap them around.
putting in our numbers, which gives me 1.9125 radians per second. Coming to our equation over here, we now know everything we need to figure it out. So let's just put our numbers in. And that gives me negative 27.3 radians per second per second. The negative is, of course, indicating that we have a deceleration that we're slowing down. One day, Sandra observes Tapu practicing somersaults from the diving board. Tapu does two complete somersaults in 1.25 seconds. Calculate Tapu's average angular velocity while executing the somersaults. And so our angular velocity is just our angular displacement divided by the duration, the duration for which we already know, but we don't know the angular displacement. To find that is quite simple. We know that Tapu does two complete somersaults, which means that's two complete revolutions or two times two pi, which we'll just write as four pi. Throwing that into our equation over here, gives me 10.1 radians per second. That was a nice quick one. Question three. Serena sits on a ridge swing that is three meters long. Show that the period of the swing is 3.5 seconds. So we know that the length is three meters and that's really all we need to know. The equation for the period is two pi the square root of L over G. You can find that on your formula sheet. And so we just need to put in our numbers. Which gives me 3.47 seconds. Which is, hell, close enough I'm sure. Explain giving reasons how the period of the swing will be affected if Serena stands up on the swing while it is swinging freely. And so what standing up is going to do is going to raise her center of mass which effectively reduces the length of the pendulum. Reducing the length of the pendulum is therefore going to reduce the period of its motion. So let's write that. When Serena stands, her center of mass moves upward, which effectively reduces the length of the pendulum. Via t equals 2 pi the square root of l over g, we can see that this will decrease t in proportion to the square root of l. The graph below is that of the restoring force F on Serena against Y, which is the horizontal displacement of Serena from her equilibrium position. Explain how the information in the graph below shows that the swing is an example of simple harmonic motion. And so this graph really tells us two key things that are requirements for simple harmonic motion. Firstly, it shows that when we have a positive force, we have a negative displacement and that when we have a negative force, we have a positive displacement. This shows that the direction of the restoring force is opposite the displacement, and that is our first point. The second point is that our restoring force is proportional to the displacement. That is that it gets larger, the larger the displacement. So let's write that down. The graph shows that the restoring force slash acceleration is opposite to displacement. It also shows that the amount of force is proportional to displacement. Both are requirements for SHM. Serena swings from end A to end B with an amplitude of 1.5 meters and a period of 3.5 seconds. Using the reference circles below or otherwise, calculate the velocity of Serena and the swing when she is 0.5 meters from end B. So let's try to visualize this on our phasor diagrams. So if we're moving from end A to B, but we are stopping when she is 0.5 meters from the end, that means that our arrow swings so that it's touching roughly here. So think of the arrow as starting off here and swinging around to where it is now, since the arrows on our phasor diagrams always move counterclockwise. Now on our other phasor diagram, let's try and draw that out, but more analytically. We know that this distance here is going to be one meter. And the reason we know that is because the entire distance, which is the length of our vector is 1.5 meters. And so if we are 0.5 meters from the end, that means that this distance here must be one meter. 
And so writing down what we're given, we know that the amplitude is 1.5 meters, we know that the period is 3.5 seconds, and we're wanting to find the velocity. Now, given that we are starting at a maximum displacement, we're starting from A, our trigonometric equations are going to be these ones here, which can also be written with omega t replaced with the angle, since omega t is equal to the angle. The reason that is, is that, well, you know that the angular velocity is angle over time, if you rearrange that, then you find this here, which means I can write the equations like this. Where our angle is this one here. And so the equation that we want to use is of course the one for velocity. Where we know the amplitude, but we don't know the omega. So let's find that. So the equation for our angular velocity, our omega, is on your formula sheet as 2 pi f. Given that frequency is 1 over period, and we're given the period, we can also write it as this, which means we just need to put in our period. And that gives me 1.80 radians per second. So now we have our angular velocity here, but we don't have our angle. So how can we find that? Well, if we know that a full rotation around is 2 pi, that means that a half rotation around here must be pi, which means if we call this angle phi, that means that our theta must equal our 180 minus phi, or our pi minus phi. So it's gonna equal our full half, which is pi, minus our phi. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's just write that in now. But of course we don't know phi, so how can we find that? So if we look at our triangle, our right angle triangle that we've drawn here, we can see that we have the hypotenuse of 1.5 meters, we have the adjacent of one meter, which means that we can use a trigonometric relationship. Now, because we have the adjacent and hypotenuse, that's gonna be the cosine one, cosine of our phi equals the adjacent, which is one meter, divided by our hypotenuse, which is 1.5. Solving that for phi by taking the inverse cosine of both sides, which gives me 0 0.841 radians. And so we're ready to put our numbers in, which gives me negative 2.01 meters per second to three significant figures. So just as an aside to explain the negative there, when we modeled this motion, we started at point A and we went to point B. Now the sinusoidal motion of that is gonna look like this. And since we were asked, to find the velocity when she is 0.5 meters from end B, that means she is just yet to reach B. So let's say that's around about there. And so as you can hopefully see, we have a negative slope here when she's moving towards B. So when she's moving towards B, she has a negative velocity. And when she's moving towards A, she has a positive velocity. That's just the convention I set out in this particular model. And we're done.